All right, so I am going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, my friend Eileen Evans is uh, Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at Hewlett Packard uh, in charge of cloud computing and open source. And uh, before she went to Hewlett Packard, she was, uh, well, that's not immediately before, but, but for many years she was at uh, Sun Microsystems where she had a lot of experience in Sun's um, uh, involvement in open source software. And um, she's going to talk about licensing models and building an open source community. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate that. So um, my role at HP is a little bit unique in the sense that I lead our open source program office. Of I'll, I'll speak up. Okay, thank you for letting me know. And, and continue, if you let me know if I um, don't project well enough. Is that, can you hear me now? Okay. I'll try to speak louder. Okay. So my role at HP is, is a bit unique in the sense that I lead our open source program office, uh, which entails like compliance and our external outreach and, and community engagement, as well as uh, leading legal support for open source matters. I also lead legal support for cloud. Um, but in terms of open source, my role is a bit unique um, within the company. And before, I, I've been leading open source now at HP for a couple of years, and I've been with HP for three years. Um, about six months after coming into HP, I uh, had an opportunity to transfer into the business and do a business role uh, for six months. And that role uh, presented itself in the cloud organization. And it was at that point in time when HP was deciding to go with um, OpenStack as its cloud offering. So I had the opportunity to participate in that decision making process and then transfer over to the business to do a six month rotation into the business to really help drive the community engagement and drive our participation in OpenStack. And for me, it, w it was a, a great learning experience because prior to that, my, my role at Sun was in the legal department. And so I had really looked at open source before that primarily from a legal lens. Um, and I'd been with Sun for nearly 12 years and had a, you know, a great experience there working with all kinds of open source projects from Java to OpenOffice to um, OpenSolaris, uh, across the gamut, MySQL. So it was a great experience, but I'd always sort of looked at things from a legal lens. So for me, transferring into the business, I think, gave me a new perspective on um, and definitely broadened my horizons for the way that I look at open source and the way that I engage with communities. So for me, it was a great learning experience and, and helped prepare me, I think, for the role uh, when I had the opportunity to take over and lead the open source program office. So the, the topic today I'm going to discuss really is around um, licensing models and building communities. So it's, it's kind of tying those two areas of my experience together. And I'm going to try to keep the, the presentation part fairly short because I actually do want to solicit input from you guys, so heads up. So from an agenda perspective, I'm going to talk through sort of what I think at a very simplistic level what you need to build a vibrant and successful open source community. <coughs> and then talk about you know, the open source license and what role that plays um, in building a community. And then I want to kind of look at the lens of the landscape, and I know this is something that Bradley spoke about earlier, really sort of looking at the permissive license and how we're starting to see more projects as permissively licensed projects and see what impact that has and how that's shaping out. And then also I want to solicit input about the, what your thoughts are in terms of you know, sort of why that's happening as well as the, the potential impact of that longer term. So at, at a very simplistic level, I believe there's three critical components to build a successful and vibrant open source community. Uh, first and foremost, I think you need a great technology. Um, I also believe you need sound governance structure. And that's something we, sp we spoke about yesterday in the panel, the governance piece of it. And then third, I, I believe that the license also plays a role in that. You need a license that is perceived fair and perceived favorable within the community as well. But I, I mean, I recognize that these three are not created equal. I mean, clearly, um, technology is the one that, that is key and the most critical component here. Uh, because without a great technology, the governance model and licensing model are essentially irrelevant. But that being said, I do think that the open source license plays a role in helping to build a community. It plays a role in adoption. I think it, it has an interesting role within that whole ecosystem that I, I want to talk about. Um, and so for the purposes of, of this discussion, and I'm going to tee it up, and I realize I'm going to grossly oversimplify licensing models. Um, and I'm going to grossly oversimplify them to all open source licenses are either copyleft or permissive. 
and by copy left, I mean you have a contractual obligation to contribute modifications back to the community. And in permissive, you don't have that contractual obligation. So I, I realize it's a gross <laughs> oversimplification, but just bear with me as we, as we talk through this, because I do want to get some, some good feedback out of this. So that being said, can a permissively, permissive license be used to build an open source community? The interesting thing is I was, I was grappling with this question about 10 years ago when I was with, at Sun Microsystems. Um, I had the opportunity to help lead our efforts in open sourcing Solaris. And Solaris was Sun's operating system. And it was a, a really key and critical piece of technology for Sun. And at the time when I was grappling with this, I mean, one of the, the business things that we wanted to accomplish there is we wanted to build an open source community around it. So that was one of the objectives in open sourcing. It was to build this community. So th we re recognized that the licensing model would play a role in that. And at the time, I was really struggling with this question. And I, I spoke with a number of open source luminaries. I spoke with other lawyers. I looked at what was happening in the community. And I came to the conclusion at that point in time, 10 years ago, that you could not use a permissive license to build a community. And maybe, you know, I, mean, I, I recognize I hadn't been practicing law um, that long at that point in my career. So m maybe I looked at things from more of a black and white perspective. But that's what I believed at that point in time. I believe that you really, in order to build that strong, vibrant community, you needed copy left. And so I came to it from that vantage point. So then I was, I've been struggling with this question recently and thinking, is the same, you know, if I look at this question today, do I believe the same thing? Do I believe today that a permissive license can be used to build um, a vibrant open source community? And I think in order to answer that question, I started thinking about, okay, well, wh how can I help, you know, navigate this and answer this question? And so I started, oh, speaking up. Okay, thank you. Speak louder. So to, in order to help answer that question, I wanted to look at sort of what was happening in the licensing model ecosystem in general. And then also what was happening in terms of vendor engagement with those open source projects. And then thirdly, what was happening in terms of contributions to open source projects. So I was kind of looking at all of those in order to help me understand and better answer this question. So in terms of what's happening um, within the licensing landscape ecosystem in general. What I saw is I started looking at various survey sources. I looked at BlockDoc, Flossmole, and Google Code. And what I saw was pretty interesting. Even though those three survey sources all used you know, different methods, statistical samples, what have you, they were all, to me, either showing and demonstrating or supporting the same general trend that I, I thought was happening within the ecosystem, which was there was an increase in permissively licensed projects. So again, there, what I was starting to, to sort of hear through anecdotal, started to see, was sort of, um, it was supported by the evidence as far as the, these survey sources as well. Now I recognize that, this is not to say the GPL is going away anytime soon, because it's still, you know, in terms of absolute numbers, it's by far the clear winner. However, I did find it an interesting trend. And so I thought, let me dig a little bit deeper and find out, you know, what else I can glean from this in order to try to help answer these kinds of questions. So in terms of, uh, this was uh, Aaron Williamson um, showed this at a recent Linux um, event. And I, I found this interesting as well, because you know, get on, on the GitHub um, part of what are these, these projects? And again, it's, it's sort of demonstrating that we're having more and more permissive licenses out there. And that's, there's sort of this increase in that. Yes. How do those figures account for forking? Um, can I see the questions for, for the end? OK, sure. thank you. Thanks. And the next thing I started looking at was vendor engagement. Um, from with these open source projects. Because, and, and again, these, these statistical samples aren't great, but I, I was looking at 451 Group and trying to just, again, grasp a better understanding of what was happening in this, in, this, in this ecosystem. And what I saw was, you know, there's this gradual shift in uh, strong copy left in terms of vendor engagement with these projects. Gradual sh shift up until around 2006. 2006, 2007, we start to see a pretty sharp decline in the hard copy left licenses in terms of vendor engagement. And around the same time period, this 2006-2007 time period, we start to see a, a more significant increase in terms of permissive licenses, in, in terms of the vendor engagement with these projects. Oh, it's hard to read these. <laughs> this is over here, number of vendors, and then yeah. those are the years. Sorry, a small, apologize, small graphics. Have expressed a, one of these preferences. 
<laughs> yes, in terms of, oh, yes, preferences in terms of so participating with projects. Survey. Yes, exactly. So the, what do the vendors prefer to engage with? What yeah. kind of projects? Yeah. Thank you. And I have a small, small font, so from the back, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, and then the, the third thing I looked at was contributions. Contributions in terms of um, how are developers and, con and companies contributing to these projects. And for the contribution piece, I looked at a very small sample. I was looking at trying to get create look at some of the similarly situated projects that are new open source projects. Um, so what I looked at in this case was uh, three cloud projects, similarly situated cloud projects, all open source. I looked at OpenStack, CloudStack, and Eucalyptus. So OpenStack and CloudStack, both permissively licensed. Eucalyptus copy left. A caveat and footnote is, is CloudStack actually changed its licensing model in 2012 from a copy left model to a permissive model. And so as I was kind of digging around that, I also found some interesting statistics around that, which were that the number of contributions and the number of contributors, particularly the number of contributors, there was a pretty significant increase um, in that year and a half period after they made the licensing model change, which kind of was contrary to what I honestly expected. Um, so it was interesting. Um, <laughs> from that time period, it went from 50, approximately 50 contributors to 250. So significant increase there. Um, and then with respect to eucalyptus, it's kind of what I would have expected 10 years ago, and it's what I expected now, which is basically that um, when you have a copyleft project, you do have contributors, and you do have that sense of community, and you're building that, that collaboration, and you're having the contributions back, and witnessed by the number of commits, et cetera. With Apache, um, the Apache 2.0 for OpenStack, this was the one I found really interesting, because um, I, I'm very involved with OpenStack, um, I was one of got involved with OpenStack pretty early on within HP, and um, I had the opportunity to help set up the OpenStack Foundation, and then um, I participate uh, as a director on the OpenStack Foundation board as well. So this one I, I'm pretty familiar with from the technology side, but for me it was interesting to look at this from the contributor perspective, in the sense that I was quite frankly just some, somewhat amazed by the number of contributors, the number of commits, and lines of code contributed here. So again, it's not what I'd expected. Instead, because if I looked at this from where I was looking at the lens that I had 10 years ago, I would have expected um, that the numbers would be much lower. Because I think that's one of the things that, you know, when I was, quite frankly, um, at Sun and we were open source in Solaris, that was one of my concerns. I was concerned that if we, you know, put the code out there under a permissive license, that we wouldn't build a community, we wouldn't get the contributions back. But I think this sort of, um, shows that it, it can indeed happen. And I think I'm going to make a, a you know, a, again, this is going to be a very simplification, simplified uh, conclusion here, but I, I, I want to open it up for dialogue and I want to get some feedback on this. Um, from, but so again, looking at the question I asked 10 years ago, today I think I would answer the question differently. And it's, it's you know, OpenStack is one single example. I recognize there's, there's, you know, many, many open source projects out there. But for me, I'm looking at it through this lens and trying to, to make sense of it all. And I think, again, going back to the original one of, of those components that are needed, you obviously need a great technology, um, which OpenStack is, is a great technology. You also need sound governance structure, which I think the, the project, they took that very seriously and created a very sound governance structure. I think it was a sound governance structure um, before it was turned over to a foundation, too, to be honest. I mean, I think... Rackspace did a number of things right in creating a project policy board and, and, you know, and creating that technical meritocracy around the project. But nonetheless, I think under the foundation, it is a sound governance structure with, you know, you've got a foundation, you also have a technical committee that really does run the technical piece of the project. And then the licensing model, I think, helped drive that adoption. Um, but nonetheless, I think, I think permissive licensing license can be used to build those kinds of projects um, and to drive that. So to, um, that's, this is my last slide, but I do want to um, go back to a prior slide uh, when I open it up for questions. But I think you had a question first. I'm sorry, first row? Apologize. I was just asking about the, um, the slide with the GitHub you want me to go back to that? Yeah. Um, about yeah. how it, it was counting forks. Was it counting all of the forks of a particular project as one? Or was it yeah, it was. It was. I think it was doing the top level licensing. But the other thing that I remember from the sur from that survey as well, which I thought was interesting, is because uh, a lot of the um, projects on Get, my understanding is initially they weren't licensed at all. So what they did was they tried to compile, and it was a, a smaller percentage, right? Because they took a, a survey sample of those, and then what they tried to do is, is get the highest level license, but, but it doesn't account for that. So no. So I mean, there's there's probably that piece of, and then the what you were talking about with compatibility and sort of the licensing pieces of it. 
there's I think there's multiples of those. And Richard, I think you had a comment there. Well, I think th that was taken from um, Aaron Williamson. It was Aaron Williamson. And yes. I, if that was the data that he did using Bossology, yes, it was using I think Bossology someone asked him tool. the same question yeah. about whether this accounts for forks. And I don't recall the answer. You were at the talk as well, right? He said that he said he did uh, have some stuff to account for folks. Okay. That was his answer when we were asked. Oh, okay. So, okay. Great. I was just uh, like, uh, again, for me, it's. I think it's new and it's 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 interesting the these the shift. Bradley, do you have any comments in light of your um, talk earlier? I mean, I'd love to hear. Well, so, so I mean, I, th yeah. I think that your talk sounds to me almost like you're making a, a defense of yes, you could do a community with permissive licenses, which I, I think is, is accurate. I think that anybody who says you can't is in error. So, so well, I, I believed actually, you couldn't ten years ago. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> uh, my argument would be I think copyleft builds better communities because it's a better constitution. I, I sort yeah. of see it. If you want to talk about governance, I see it that the a permissive license, like the Articles of Confederation, and sorry to be U.S., but the like the Articles of Confederation, which was a, a very loose thing that was abandoned by the United States in the early days. And the U.S. Constitution much more like the GPL. It's a stronger binding force. <laughs> 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 so that's, that's but, but it is an interesting one. Yeah. But, but yeah. Because the Article Confederation was too loose. That's the point. It just it just allows allowed the states to do whatever they wanted. And sometimes bad things for the the whole country. That's my point. Oh, so I, I guess this analogy doesn't work. Everybody's looking like I'm crazy. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, that, as a developer working yes. in a GPL project. Yes. Um, the, so the, the, the people who take our, our project and then make their own products on it mm -hmm. um, are required to push the source. Right. Perhaps on the web website or the patches or things like that. They're not required to try and upstream them. Right, right, right. right. The fact is that in practice, the thing that drives, the, in, in practice, the people in the core community don't go and take those patches and upstream them themselves. Mm -hmm. And the thing that drives the vendors to upstream the patches is actually having to rebase to new ones. Right, so that's right. that was my, my question too, because that's what I was thinking yeah. was driving so, so, so a lot so of this in, so in, in, is the in, technical so debt. Finish, finish by, by yes. what I was say, was mm -hmm. that um, in normal kind of every day when, when things are not going, when things are going well, mm -hmm. when things are not going wrong, mm -hmm. um, functionally BSD and GPL essentially act the same. So the only, the only mm -hmm. difference actually is happens when things kind of, kind of go to hell and mm. there's a big difference of opinion right. than um, if people want to, they can actually take the take the patches and mm -hmm. and, and actually themselves mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, right. Does that make sense? Right. That th that does make sense. And and so d let me ask you a question. Do you think a big piece of this then is because of that technical debt? Because in other words, it just makes it easier to contribute it back. And uh, yeah. So so the, okay. yeah, basically the from the developer's the perspective, technical debt. So it's, it's as far as in my observation. Yeah. And people can disagree with me if you want, but in my observation, um, the companies that have, you, you always, you know, if you develop a product, you have to, you know, do local patches because mm -hmm. you're, you need, you need a product, right? Right. You to be your specifications. Mm -hmm. The thing that forces you to upstream that, and then, is the technical debt you're basing. Okay. Um, so, it's, I, I don't think, in my project, I don't think I've ever seen someone from the community mm -hmm. take a patch set that was published by someone and upstream it themselves. Okay. It's always been the people who wrote the patch themselves upstreaming it. Okay. Um, because of the, the technical debt. Okay. Because of, also because of personal commitment to open, the open source way. That yes. Of yes. So. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I've asked my, myself um, if, if, if you could do this comparison. I mean, um, if, if there is a, a, a vendor who has um, money and, and who is who's going to, the, to, to support the open source trend and mm -hmm. trying to, to benefit from it, that um, that they are of course um, putting a lot of money in uh, building up a very good uh, project infrastructure, mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> this is also very attractive for for developers. And mm -hmm. I think the most developers are, are not really uh, thinking of of the exact um, license term. Mm -hmm. um, they they are thinking more about the technology, and okay. I think everyone has has a bit different uh, motivation. And I think when 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 the when the figure of uh, let's say project with uh, um, permissive mm -hmm. licenses is rising, yeah. then it's more um, related um, to let's say the the, the money which are. Uh, which our um, vendors are putting in open source technology. That's a good point too. Okay, thank you. 
think regarding vendor involvement, you should uh, account for another variable in this. This is basically what I say the education of the target community, the education of the experience of the target vendor community. Um, so if you look at IT, I would say uh, many users are well educated right now. They assess open source well and they know right. what the, the value of this is. <coughs> if you look at different communities, if you look at, for example, at the uh, industrial world where I come from, mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit different. And then uh, people are more conservative regarding what they do and what they reveal, what they publish. So in this area, I see uh, the high value of copyleft licenses that they remind at least the users, uh, the, the companies who are using yeah. it, that they have to think about how to deal with this thing, how yeah. to deal with their own changes. They have to read it anyway. And I often receive this kind of feedback, well, we have to publish them anyway, so why not work with upstream? It yes. Has to work anyway, okay. So now we mm -hmm. can also do it with upstream. Right. So this is a kind of a reminder, basically, and this helps in this area. Okay. There are other areas where we know what to do. Great, thank you. Um, I have a feeling that not, not just, uh, you said moving <coughs> permissive licenses, um, why, why that's happening? Yeah, that's it. I'm curious but about that as well. It's, it's very easy for developers to start a project and do it in MIT or BSP because then okay. you can just use the patchworks with some other license without having to uh, be bound by the license you use. Oh, you that's use. interesting. Okay. So it, Okay. Is that well? Is that sort of well thought? I mean, is that the common understanding? Do you think in the developer community? Because that's that's the thing that I find I interesting. The, the company I work for, yeah. We did a project in MIT license because we okay. knew the partner we did it with might not be trusted. So maybe oh. we could fork away or just move away from it and then have our own project, maybe post source it even. Sorry, guys. And, um, <laughs> But so I, I think it's just permissive also gives the permission to do whatever you want with it. Right, right. As a company, but also for the developer app. Okay. That's, thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you. I only got five minutes. Oh, okay. Can so I? Sort of related to that, I, I'm curious how this plays out over time. Um, because yes. I think there are certain trends and, um, and different understandings in different communities about licensing. And I was wondering if you looked at sort of this community growth over the life cycle of a project and maybe like, you know, compared because we looked at, at particular years for particular mm -hmm. projects. Yeah. And so I'd be curious to see how, how it played out over time. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Karen, and that's something I thought about as well. Like how, because I, I recognize like right now using OpenStack as, as a single example. Right now it's, you know, it's a very popular project, it's doing quite well. It, the community and everyone is getting along, right? What happens if that, if, if somehow it, at some point in the future that's no longer the case? It's like, then I start to think, okay, how would, you know, how it plays out because it's under Apache versus if they had licensed it under a different licensing model. How would that play out long term? And that's something that um, that I, I'm, you know, very interested to kind of see how this all plays out. But but again, it, I kind of look at it from the perspective of, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I wonder what we're going to see, you know, five, ten years down the road. But it's a really great point because I've thought about that quite a bit. Bradley, you're going to make a comment about that. Well, well yeah, and, and also because uh, both we're out of time. Fantastic. My last okay. comment was weird and crazy, so uh, so that analogy doesn't work. But, but, <laughs> but I thought of a better way to uh, a, better, a, a concrete example to explain it. I, th I think when you're talking about core, uh, what, what developers would consider the core application, right. I think there's not much difference because of the point you were making over there about the not wanting to rebase. Yes. But most software systems these days have some way of putting add-ins uh, of some sort that aren't part of core, a plug-in architecture, mm -hmm. something like that, and that's where left really has value because that's often mm -hmm. a different community. So you have the core mm -hmm. community which OpenStack has as part of the OpenStack Foundation yes. and so forth. But I know OpenStack you can do add-on modules and so forth. Right. And that I would expect, this is pure speculation, yeah. that that community will slowly be a slightly different community. Mm -hmm. And that community will be one mostly of proprietary add-ons. Whereas if OpenStack were GPL'd, those add-ons would have to also be GPL'd. So, so while your main community, the core community, may may make the hum along just great <coughs> right. for indefinitely, mm -hmm. the plugin community may become a proprietary ghetto. That's an interesting point. So are you trying to say there that the license is the best for us mm -hmm. to keep the community together? Well, but to keep those ancillary communities, right? I mean, yeah, I mean Dyer Wall used to talk about this onion of Pearl, right? And so Pearl was GPL. Do you think that has other force and factors that help keep our community together? I don't know, but I've seen it fail in other permissively licensed projects. But I don't know specifically enough about the OpenStack community, say. What do you think? I think there's, 
I think if people have enough incentives to be involved with the community, because there's so much going on there, but being inside the community, it's just... But you can be both at once, right? You can be developing... If you have a good separation of APIs, you could be off-writing proprietary plugins and be part of the core community simultaneously. Yeah, but we don't encourage that behavior necessarily, but it's not the... Like, we don't need the license to be... Everybody... Many companies are already doing an open stack. No, what so I'm saying is don't keep the APIs stable. Yeah. So. That's what LLVM says, too. I'm skeptical. <laughs> What drove OpenStack to allow it to become progressive? Well, it was actually before my time, but I, but I can tell you the history. <laughs> um, I'm out of time. Well, uh, two yeah, minutes. I want you to repeat the question before you give the answer. Okay. Two. Okay. The, okay. The, the question was, what drove OpenStack to choose a permissive licensing model? Um, and it was before my time, before I got involved in the project, because they actually open sourced it in July 2010. And it was a joint project between RAS, um, uh, Rackspace and NASA, federal government, and they actually chose, the reason they chose Apache is because they wanted to drive adoption, and they believed by choosing a permissive licensing model, <coughs> it would enhance and drive adoption, um, and increase that, so that was the primary reason, at least that's what I've been told from that piece of history. Actually, so, so there was another reason, um, there was a lot of criticism of eucalyptus at the time, Oh yeah. I remember from giving that talk at the OpenStack <laughs> Summit. Uh, last year, uh, eucalyptus, which you add on that slide, eucalyptus had GPLv3 yes. and a very t uh, a model uh, controlled by one company. Mm -hmm. um, at the, the predecessor of CloudStack was very similar, used GPLv3 yes. initially. And I think OpenStack wanted to distinguish itself from these companies that had business models that were being heavily mm -hmm. criticized at the time, uh, what were called open core business models. So I think that was part of it as well. That's an excellent point, Richard. So You're right. Yes. Partially a reactionary as opposed to being done on the merits? No, it was a political act. It, okay. I, I, yeah. I would say progressive because these these um, uses of GPLv3 by, I mean, it's related to that point of, uh, that the 451 group made about yes. um, single vendors, uh, m multiple vendors engaging in projects <laughs> under permissive license. Yes. The uh, Eucalyptus was not a multiple in, multiple vendor project, neither mm -hmm. was cloud, CloudStack or mm -hmm. Cloud.com. Mm -hmm. These were very much controlled by one company. Um, I mean, Rackspace had that role to some degree in, in OpenStack, but it was uh, evolving towards a multi-vendor product, right. and, and I think that was what their goal was on some so, so we're out of time, but let's let Eileen get the last word because it's yes. her talk. So do you want to sum up Thank anything? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>